You know, uh, Sister Tina, as they have gone to Miami, which she has, uh, well, yesterday she was to, to walk through graduation. She re received her doctor's degree, and uh, very proud of her for that. Amen. And you know, oftentimes, I've, I've always wondered about this, uh, and you may want to ask them when they get back. In fact, if you would, ask Brother Philip this question. Normally, sometimes when somebody gets a doctor's degree, you, you, you say doctor so-and-so and all like that. Well, before she had a doctor's degree, she had a master's. So I was wondering if Philip always called her master. <laughs> I mean, you know, before, since he's a doctor now, maybe he don't have to. You may want to ask him that when he gets back. I'm sure he'll like that. You got that on video too, don't you? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I hope everybody has received a handout. If we have missed you uh, in some, some way. If you would just raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. A Westside Weekly and a, and a handout of the outline of today's passage, the scripture. And uh, this way, that when you, if you want to, when we do our good confession, if you want to just hold this up, it's got the scriptures on there or your Bible, either one. Uh, feel free to do so. But if you have not received one, if you would just raise your hand and on uh, Brother Johnny or Brother Philip, Brother Steve, somebody will run around here and make sure they get you. Okay? All right. All is good. All right. This morning, we're going to look and we're going to begin uh, with Deuteronomy chapter 34 this morning. We're going, that's going to be from our text. But we're also going to look at Joshua as well. And... Uh, before we do that, I want you to think about something this morning. I want you to think about, in most places, well, in every place you live, there are many doors. Think about doors that it is the place you live. You have the front door, you have the back door, you have a, maybe a sliding glass door, you, you got a bathroom door, you got bedroom doors, you got doors, doors, doors everywhere. But there's also a certain door there that you never really think about too much. It's, it's called the closet door. And the closet door is probably used more than any other door because you're always putting stuff in there. And you've got to get stuff out. Now, inside the closet, of course, is something very important to us. Okay? Most of us wouldn't come to church if we didn't go inside the closet and get something out of it called clothes. Right? So the clothes and shoes and and you know people usually have a certain type of clothing that they like to wear. You know, everybody has something favorite. Inside their closet, just certain that, that, that there's favorites. Okay? Uh, it, it could be blue jeans or it could be suits or it could be dresses or it could be paint, whatever it is. Everybody has something favorite. Amen, that they like to wear, they feel comfortable in. Amen. You know, my favorite. I've got a favorite too. And this is going to surprise you. I know what you're probably thinking. Suits. That's not it. Okay? Ties. I got plenty of ties, got suits, but no, that's not it. That's not my favorite. Okay? So people are going to say, well, boots. I know you got a lot of pair of boots. You like to wear boots and all like that. that. That's true. I like that. That's my second favorite. But believe it or not, and this is going to surprise you, my favorite item in the closet. I feel lost without them. That's hanging up. Is a t-shirt. I I am addicted to t-shirts. I, I mean, I, I've got to have a t-shirt. Some men wear them, some don't. That, that you know, just your preference. But for me personally, it's just something about a t-shirt. If I don't have a t-shirt, I don't feel right. Okay. I, I just gotta have a t-shirt. Got a t-shirt on now. Got to wear a t-shirt. I mean, that's a, that's the main thing I look for. It's a t-shirt, right? And and I like t-shirts. And 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 I've noticed that things have changed over the years because. The price of t-shirts have gone up. And, and t-shirts have even changed somewhat. And, and I'm one of those that, I guess you call crew necks, you know. I like the big, thick neck, you know. And, and I like the thick t-shirts. The problem is that they're, they're expensive sometimes, you know. But I, I really, really like t-shirts. I, I just always wear them. And um, it's, one of, it's, it's one of my favorites. Now, what's really strange, if you go in my closet... Okay? We got his and hers closets in our house. Because they can't fit together. Okay? But inside the closet, you'll find blue jeans, you'll find suits, you'll find ties, you'll find boots, 
uh, work pants, uh, short sleeve, long sleeve shirts, you know, just, just the general stuff. But there's always certain clothes in there I don't wear. It's, it's not because I don't like, okay? It's just, just, just don't get to them. It seems like I wear basically the same thing over and over again, in a sense. I, you know, uh, and, and they are washed, in case y'all are wondering. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes, okay. And they are washed, okay. But there are certain clothes, and, and usually I'm pretty good about if I get something new, I take something out and throw away. I, I'm usually pretty good about that, but I'm, I'm not 100%. So there's still stuff in there that's just wasted space. There's a stuff in there that, I, you know, I'm just probably not going to wear, but it's going to sit there for years, to be honest with you. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know if you've got uh, coats, you know, like when it gets cold, just, just a certain type of coat, you wear coats, you know, to because it's cold outside. Well, you might have, I don't know, four or five jackets, but, you know, you probably only wear one, maybe two, you know, but they're in there just, just in case you ever decide. So... There's a lot of times that, that there's stuff in the closet that you're just not going to get to. And to be honest with you, some of you, you might have clothes in your closet based upon your weight. In other words, if I gain weight, I still got clothes. But, you know, I still got these. Or if I lose weight, I, I got the clothes for here. And that, that's your justification behind it. Or if I stay the same, I got clothes. Like that. I got three brackets. Where I'm at, in case you gain weight, then I just lose weight. Okay? So, so that justification there of where you do it. But, but if we're all to be honest, if we was to <coughs> go in our closet, we could say, you know what? We could really narrow a lot of things down if we really wanted to. Because it's things we, we probably won't wear. Now, it, it, it basically needs to come out of the closet. And the reason why I bring that up is starting the new year off like we have, I know everybody, most everybody, if you're a believer, one of your goals, one of your resolutions is you want to grow spiritually in your life. There's many people out there that every year we say this, me included, I want to get closer to the Lord than I've ever been. And you want to grow spiritually. And I use this example because a lot of times picture yourself as a closet. And picture what's in it. What's in it? Everything that's in it. You're a closet and picture what's in it. And if the truth be known, if you look in it, you'll, what you'll find is, is you're busy. You'll find that you got too much to do. you find that you got more than you can handle. Now, the bad part about that is it's, it's true, probably. It's, it's probably true. However, it's just like stuff in the closet. Like clothes and stuff. You don't need all of it. And inside your life, if you look at your body as a closet, there's a lot of stuff that probably needs to come out that's no longer needed. So you can fit room for God. So that you can put your spiritual life ahead of everything else. Because you'll never experience joy in your life until you have joy in your spiritual life. Yeah. You say, well, if I had a million dollars, I'd be extremely happy. You might for a season. But if you look at people that have these things that always want to accomplish it, I remember Troy Aikman who led the Dallas Cowboys to, to two or three Super Bowl wins. And after the first, that was his goal, is to win the Super Bowl. And, and, and after Troy Aikman won that first one, he said, is this it? Is this it? And, and, and oftentimes you, you look at it and, and you say, you know what, it's, yes, it brings me temporary happiness, but what I want is joy. You find millionaires and billionaires who are still trying to do something because they're not satisfied. They're, they're not satisfied with where they're at. And, and, they, and they want to get deeper. They want, they want more and more and more. And they just can't seem to have that satisfaction, that joy. But you know, people will never, ever, and I think this is the way God builds us. I think, I think it's inside of us. We'll never have true joy in our life until we have joy in our spiritual life. King David was a classic example of this. In, in the Bible, he, he got away from God. He, 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 got, he, he got to where he just got away from God. He was a man of God most of his life. And then all of a sudden, he just got to where he just totally got away from. And David looked at his life. He was the most powerful king ever. He, he had everything, uh, power, prestige, money, fame, women, you name it. He had it all. 
And in Psalm 51, he says, Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. And what he meant by this was, I'm just, just not happy. I'm, I got spurts, I got moments, but there's no joy. His son Solomon, who was so close to the Lord at a younger age, and later he, he just kind of went off. And you read the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote, and he, he, he got to, it's, it's almost kind of so pessimistic how he wrote it. But what he was writing about was a miserable Christian. He was talking about his own life, is how I'm saved, and you know what? I experienced this, and I experienced this, and I did this, and I did this, and you had this, and I had that. I had more than you could ever have, and I, and I was miserable. In fact, he used the word vanity. It was just emptiness. You see, you lost your joy. And so many people today, even when they come to church, there's no joy. There's no joy deep down because their closet's full. And their spiritual life is not there. And, and, and they're not making no room. They're not taking out stuff of their lives so that they can fit God in. They're trying to put God on top of what already they got. And it's like shoving more clothes in the closet. You know, eventually the rod starts to bow. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know how to put clothes on it, it just starts to bow? And, you know, you start looking at it and say, God, i got to do something. And we, and we very seldom do it. So what I want to look at today is some things that we got to realize how important prioritizing our spiritual life is. And we're going to look at what Joshua, some of the things that, that Joshua had to do to keep growing. Joshua was saved. Joshua was a man of God. But he got to the point of his life where he had to take a big leap in faith. And we're going to look at what he did today and, and some of the things about it. But before we do that, if you would, let's all stand for reading God's Word. And we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I'm going to begin with verse number 5. Verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 5. And Moses, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he was buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Nobody knows where Moses was buried at. He was buried alone. Nobody. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, and his natural face, uh, or his natural force, abated. In other words, Moses looked pretty healthy. There was nothing wrong with Moses. Moses looked pretty good. I mean, he didn't look like he, he aged any. He looked, he looked good. And he died. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plain of Moab 30 days. That was normal for a funeral. That was a normal period of, of mourning for 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses was ended. Were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun and was full of the spirit of wisdom and Moses had laid his hand upon him and the children of Israel hearkened unto him that he did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet watch this, there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses. In other words, there was never another man like Moses. Not even Charlton Heston. Okay. Who the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs of wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants to all his land. And in all the mighty, in all that mighty hand and in that great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Let's make our good confession. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I, am what it says I, am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'm about to receive the indestructible, incorruptible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is hungry. My heart is, My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Thy servant hear. Thy servant hear. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you so much. I want to point out some things about Joshua's life. And if you want to turn with me or look on your handout to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be looking at some of the things that Joshua went through. 
Okay? And in order to grow spiritually, there's three things that I'm going to mention. In order to really get closer to the Lord, these are three things that we're going to also have to do. Okay? Let me share the first one with you. Number one, face the facts that it's real. Number one, you got to face the facts that it's real. I want you to look at verse number two of Joshua chapter one. God speaking. And he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise. Go over to this Jordan thou and all the people into the land which I do give unto them, even the children of Israel. I want you to keep in mind that verse. Steve Jobs is probably one of the most creative individuals in American history. This guy has been truly amazing. He, he passed away last year. But Steve Jobs was the founder of Apple products. Like iPads, iPods, Mac computers, Apple TV, etc. But he had a vision for his product. And, of course, the biggest competition that he was going to run into was Microsoft. Okay? Now, there's a difference because Microsoft is a software package. It's, it's just a software package where Apple is their own hard drive. They already have everything in their own system. And people said that Apple would never work. In 1983, there was a man by the name of John Scully. He was the CEO of Pepsi-Cola. And Steve Jobs wanted him to come work for him. He said, I want you to come with me and work with me. Now this is in 1983. Some of you are saying I wasn't born then. Okay. In 1983, I bought our first computer, home computer, in 1990 something. 91, 92. Everybody told me what you bought was one of the top of the lines. The name brand was Activa. It was IBM compatible. This thing cost me bundles of money. We saved up, saved up, saved up. It was a special gift for Debbie, and I saved up trying to buy it. When I got through buying everything, it was just a computer, a small monitor, a screen, two speakers, and all like this, the final price was nearly $3,000. Now, folks, that's a lot of money spent on a computer. And that was a lot of money back then. But we saved, put money back, all like this, to pay for Now, that thing had one gigabyte. If you don't know how, if you don't know computer language, gigabyte, the one gigabyte is nothing now. But everybody said, oh, yeah, that'll last you a lifetime. Okay? Well, now they make stuff with a, you, even your phones, your smartphones has 16, 32, 64 gigabytes. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's just the amount of memory that's in there. Well, I bought that computer, and we didn't even have Wi-Fi. We, we had the phone. Please tell me if you got internet, you don't have phone. Because th this thing, it would take, you, you'd go in there, and you'd have, you know, you, you, you could go fix breakfast and lunch and everything else by the time you're... you're site came up, okay? But anyway, I had a computer. So this was this was some 10 years before that, in 1983. So you can imagine the popularity of Pepsi-Cola versus the popularity of computers. I mean, people were still in the stage of saying it ain't going to work. But he asked the CEO, he said, come with me, come work with me. And this, the man finally agreed to leave. Now you gotta remember, chief executive officer, CEO. I mean, you're you're talking about huge. You're talking, you're, you're over everything at Pepsi Cola. He decided to leave because this is what Steve Jobs said. Do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or come with me and change the world? Now, if you look at computers today, you say, "Oh, well, I would have done it too." Well, you would you done it in 1983? Being, being the top man at, at, or top person at Pepsi-Cola versus computers, something that ain't even proven themselves yet. But he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life or do you 
you want to come change the world with me? Which he did. He left and went to Apple. Now I say that because when you come back to verse 2 of Joshua chapter 1, God's speaking to Joshua. And basically he's saying, you're going to change what's happened in the last 40 years. You know that up to this point, the Israelites have spent 40 years in the wilderness because they're disobedience. And God is telling Joshua, you're going to lead these people into the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, and you're going to divide up the land between the 12 tribes. I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to lead you every step of the way. And, and Joshua, you're my man, and you're no longer following Moses. You're fixing to lead. Now, you say, what's so unusual about that? Notice God's Verbiage. Notice God's speech here. Notice God's dialogue here with Joshua. It's plain and it's simple. He cuts to the, I mean, there, there's no sugar water here. Joshua, Moses is dead. Get up. <laughs> Excuse me. Moses is dead. Get up. Wow. God doesn't mean. What do you mean? I mean, you, you're talking, God's fixing to make a dramatic change here in the leadership of Israel. And, and God's not sure of God either. He said, God, hey, he's dead. The leader, Moses, he's dead. You're taking his place. Now, understand something. Joshua was extremely close to Moses. Joshua was like his right hand man, him and Caleb. They, they, they were very close to Moses. And what God is saying, he, he, he's, he's not here. And you're here. And now, get with it. Moses is not here. You're here. Get with it. Now, you're talking about a huge project. Because now he's got to lead these billions of people into the promised land. And then he's got to divide up the land. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute. Sometimes... We just don't face the facts of what's true. Joshua is fixing to replace a legend. He is fixing to go into a whole new world of it, a leap of faith. He's, he's fixing to change the world. I mean, he's got to take over for somebody that was basically king. And God doesn't pull no punches. God doesn't sugarcoat anything. He tells him like it is. Moses is dead. You're the man. Get up. Now, you got to face the facts. It's time that you and I have to step up to the plate in our spiritual life. Have you noticed in the Bible, had God always calls people to do specific tasks and usually more than one? He calls them to do something. And He always equips them with the ability to do it. You might not have the confidence to say, I can't do that. I, I can't preach or I can't sing. I can't teach. I, I'm no good at this stuff. There's nothing I can do at church. Well, there's always something you can do. There's something that you're talented at. There's something that you're gifted with. Now, you may not have the self-confidence in yourself, but understand, these people right here were in the same boat that we're in. And when they were called to do something, I mean, I'm sure Josh was over here, you know, I always leaned on Moses. Yeah, I, I kind of could lead, but I always had Moses to lean back on. I don't have Moses to lean back on anymore. And God is reassuring him that, that hey, you've got to face the facts. You're going to lead and, and these people, and you're going to lean on me. Now, this has been a pattern all the way throughout the Bible. You can go through the Old Testament, you can go through the New Testament. Apostle Paul, he, he was called to do something. To be, to be the great missionary, to plant churches. Timothy was called to be a pastor. Many people were, were called to do different things all the way throughout the Bible, but God gave them a specific task. And He equipped them to do it. Now, you would have thought some of these people, just like John and James and Peter and Andrew, four of the apostles, the twelve disciples, the original people that hung around with Jesus, you would have never thought these four would have been called. Matthew, probably so, because he was a tax collector. You know, he, he was educated here. 
and some of the others. Luke, you know, he, he doff. You can see some of these other people. But one thing that you had to doubt was these people were commercial fishermen. These, these people were not the brightest bulb in the lamp, if you know what I mean, according to the world's standards. But God not only called them, He called them first. And God says, you know what, even, even throughout their throughout the ministry there, while they were living, people would look at them and say, you know what, these are just dumb, ignorant fishermen. But wow! Do they know what they're talking about? They, I mean, the way they talk about this Jesus, the way they talk about, about their spirits, like, wow! Can't believe it. And God's always used people to do certain tasks for you. It is a pattern. If you ever want to truly grow in your spiritual life. And not just say it, but truly want to. You've got to face the facts that it's important. It's the most important thing that you and I could ever do. And you've got to face the facts that it's real. It's real. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, you know the story about Goliath. All of Israel was scared. All the men didn't want to fight Goliath because he's such a huge man. And Goliath had a big mouth. Uh, people call it trash talk today. He was talking down to the Israelites. He was talking down to their God. And the, the men of Israel were scared. And nobody wanted to go fight this huge man. And it was basically a one-on-one -on -one prize fight. And whoever won, won it all. Whichever, whichever person won this fight, they would take over the other country. So it was Israel versus uh, the, Phil the Philistines. And whoever won, they would have rights over that country. One on one. Winner take all. And nobody wanted to fight Goliath, but he was coming down that mountain, and he was coming back up to the Israelite side, challenging everybody and all like this. Nobody wanted to fight him, except for when David came on the scene. Now David was young. David was a young boy. Maybe in his early 20s, probably in his teens. And David said, who has defied the living God? You see, God was real to David. What I'm trying to say is, I want you to think about this. David's eyes were set on God. Israel's eyes were set on Goliath. David's eyes were set on God. He, he wasn't... That's all. He just knew what God could do because God was so real for him. His eyes were set on God. Israel was set on Goliath. Let me put it to you another way. God, David's eyes was set on what God can do. Israel's eyes was set on their problems. And you've got to face facts that, that God is real and He can handle anything that we go through in our lives. If you believe the Bible and you see what God has already done, certainly He can handle anything for us. And if we ever want to grow spiritually, we've got to come out of the closet. We've got to take some stuff and say, Lord, if I'm going to get closer to you, this has got to go so I can make room for you. Because if I try to keep everything in that closet now and add you on top of it, it's not going to work. So you have to face the facts that it's real. What's real? God is real, just like David. There, there were, you know what, we can beat this giant. That, that's not even the question because God's bigger than the giant. And what God is trying to tell Joshua here, I'm bigger than Moses. <laughs> if it wasn't for me, Moses wouldn't have made it. And, and, and he, this is what you have to do. But see, Joshua had to face the facts. I no longer have Moses. I've got to rely on God. Moses is out of my life. Moses is out of my closet. God, it's you. So let me share the second thing with you. Not only do you got to face the facts that it's real, but number two, you got to face the fears that causes restraints. you got to face the fears that causes restraints. Now, I don't know about you, but has anybody ever here had to ever tackle a new project that you've never done before? Okay, you, you, you were going to do something. And, and you had to tackle a project that you'd never done before. And, and, and you weren't sure how to do it. You thought you could do it, but you weren't sure you could do it. Let's, let's put it like this. You were scared to do it. 
And it affects you mentally. You know, you say, i got to do it, i got to do it, but you keep putting it off. I know I can do it, but I'm not sure if I can do it. But <laughs> I need to do it, but you just keep putting it off, and it just wanders in your mind until you get started. One way or another, either you mess it up or either you get it done. One way or another, you got to get started. The problem is getting started. And until you get started, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna to mess with you mentally. It's going to tear you up. It's going to affect you mentally until you get started. And sometimes the reason why you don't get started is because sometimes you're scared to tackle that new project because you don't know how it's going to turn out. But sometimes you just got to do it. I want you, I want you to notice in verse 5 here and follow me. We'll look at several verses. Verse 5. This is God speaking. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of life as I was with Moses. So, so what? So I will be with Joshua, and I will not fail thee, Joshua, or not forsake thee, Joshua. Verse number 6. Be strong of good courage, for unto the people shall thou divide an inheritance of the land which I have sworn unto the fathers. Verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Look at verse 9. Have I not commanded thee to be strong and of good courage? Be not afraid. Verse 17. According to, as we hearken unto the Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee only the Lord thy God with thee as he was with Moses. If you look at the verse, end of, uh, the end of verse 18, the last words here, only be strong and good courage. You know, over five different times, God had to tell Joshua, be strong and of good courage. I'm going to be with you. Don't panic. Don't be afraid. Wait a second. What did Joshua have to be scared of? He worked with Moses. Moses was his mentor. He traveled with Moses. He seen what Moses did. Now he's in charge. What did he have to be scared of? Well, think about it. Even though most of the people that Moses was leading back then had died in the wilderness and there's a whole other generation coming up, you still had the archives. You still had the information. You still had what Moses had done. Moses is a legend. You're not going to replace Moses. You're, nobody can replace Moses. That's what everybody's thinking. And think about what Joshua was going to have to deal with. How long was it going to be before everybody said, Hey, congratulations, Joshua, you're our man. We're going to follow you. And just not too long after that, well, you sure ain't Moses. I remember when my parents told me about Moses, how good he would have handled it that way. Okay. You'll never be like Moses, Joshua. Can you imagine mentally, emotionally, what he was going to have to deal with? And, and notice how God, why does God keep on telling Why couldn't He just tell him one time, hey, be good, be strong, courageous, don't be afraid? Why couldn't He just tell him? Why do you have to repeat Himself? Especially in the first nine verses. I mean, there's three back to back, well, actually four back to back to back. back. Why, why did He have to keep telling him, be that I'm not afraid? You know, I got it, I got it, I got it. Why are you reminding me of this? Because you know what hinders us from growing spiritually? We're afraid. We're afraid to change. We're afraid to give up something. We're afraid that this may leave, or this may leave, or I, it may change my life. I, I want God in my life, and I want to go to heaven, no doubt about that. But, but I don't. I don't want. I, I, I'm scared of change. But any time that, and, and I said this last week, that it's so important that you understand this. God loves you just the way you are. But He cares too much to keep you where you're at. There's, spiritually, there's always going to be changes to how you grow spiritually in your life. And it, it, the only way that you can do that is take a step of faith. And say, okay, Lord, if this is what you're calling me to do, Lord, if this, this is what I've got to do to grow spiritually, Lord, I've got to take something out of the closet to, to put you in. Now, I mean, even Joshua knew what the people thought of Moses. And there was times where Moses was ready to wipe them off the mat. He got mad and he blew his temper. But if you go back and if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse number 10, it says, there's never been a man like Moses. Now how would you, how would you like to be a leader and you say, you know what? There's never been a man like Moses before you. 
I mean, I mean, look at look, look at verse five in Deuteronomy chapter thirty-four. Notice what it says. Uh, so he died. Or verse, uh, excuse me, verse number eight, where the people wept and mourned for thirty days. I know that was natural, but you know they get to the point. Say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's no Moses. Well, Joshua's going to take over. Well, is he going? Is he going to be like Moses? Is he going to be that man? We, we're used to Moses. This, this is a big change. This is a change in leadership. I mean, you can imagine Joshua thinking, "Good gosh, you mean I got to follow that? <coughs> I got to follow him?" Man. So there, he was. Let's face it, he was scared. Paul wrote to Timothy in, in, in the book of First and Second Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. And Paul wrote to him and he encouraged him and, and he kept, you know, Timothy, according to the readings, it looks like he was a little timid. He was shy. You know, here he is, pastor's church with a bunch of knuckleheads, you know, and, and all like this. And, and, and Paul would say, be strong and, and you got to hand it. Preach the word in season, out of season. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. But when people start wandering away and, and people start giving up on the faith, you stay strong. Don't you give up and don't you compromise in your preaching. See, it's, he had to encourage Timothy. You can, you, you can imagine what Timothy was going through. And, and you could see what Joshua had to replace Moses. So was he scared? Did he have butterflies in his stomach? Absolutely. Will you and I go through the same thing when we're going through changes? Yes. Yes. But it's all part of growing spiritually. You see, oftentimes we expect us to grow spiritually with just what we're doing right now, stay where we are, and, and just automatically grow spiritually. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. There's going to be some faith involved. There's, there, your faith is going to be challenged. So, the second thing is you've got to face the fears that cause us restraint. I don't, I don't know. I want to, I, I'm scared to do it. Well, you know what? We all get scared sometimes. But you just got to do it. Even David told his son, before he died, I want you to build a temple for God. He gave his specific instructions. Solomon wasn't no maintenance guy. He wasn't no carpenter. He wasn't no leader. Okay? Solomon, Solomon, Solomon was nothing at the time. And God said, David told him, he said, I want you to build a temple for God. He gave his specific instructions. And this is what David left him with. Be strong and do it. Be strong and do it. Well, I'm scared. I know you. Be strong and do it. Number three. Not only do you have to face the fears that causes restraints. Not only do you have to face the facts that's real. But number three. You've got to face the Father with an attitude of renewal. You've got to face the Father talking about God with an attitude of renewal. Now, I want you to look at verse 10. Okay? I want you to look at verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, I don't know how many are like me, but there's times when I'm not careful my prayer life has no joy. My prayer life becomes more ritual. If, I, if I'm not careful. In other words, I go through the pattern of praying, but there's no uh, into it. You know what I mean? There's nothing into it. It's just, it's just I'm praying. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the right words, but deep down inside, it's not there. You know what I mean? I just go through the pattern of praying sometimes. And if I'm not careful, I begin to lose sight of how valuable and how my prayer life really needs to be. It needs to, it needs to be filled with joy. It needs to be filled with vitality. And, and, and there needs to be something in it. It's not how you say it, what you say. It's, it's, it's pouring your heart out to God. It's, it's confessing your sins. It's, 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 it's thanking Him for the many things that you have in life. There, there's things right now that you hate about your life, but you need to be thankful for things in your life. And you need to be thankful for what He's done for you and, and, and all like this. And sometimes if you're not careful, your prayer life becomes with no joy or no vitality. Now the, the reason why I say that is, if you look at verse 10, there's a very, very important word that nobody ever catches. Nobody. 
Ever catch this? Verse 10. It's the first word. Then. T-H-E-N. Then. That, that, that is the most important word in the scriptures that we just read. You say, well, then what? If you look at the first nine verses of Joshua, God's speaking. And what God is saying is, Joshua, this is what I have chosen you to do. I have handpicked you. You can no longer lean on Moses. You have to lean on me. Now, Joshua, I understand that your whole life you have, you have praised me, you have leaned on me, but you always had Moses as a comforter, a blanket, somebody you could fall back on to. But Moses, you, you, I mean, Joshua, you no longer have that, and you're going to have to lean on me. And yes, you're going to follow a legend. You're going to follow somebody that nobody else can ever replace. Ever. Joshua, you're going to have to lean on me. And Joshua, listen to me very carefully. You meditate on the Word day and night. Verse 8. You meditate day and night. In other words, now they didn't have the whole Bible back then. But they had scrolls. They had, they had, they, they had the, the information up to this point about the Israelites and how they came out of Egypt. They had Genesis on it. So they had, they had all this. They had the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They had all that. So he said, I want you to concentrate on it. You concentrate on the Word of God and look what God has done in the past. And look what God can do. If you focus on God and not on your problem, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine. And you're going to have joy in your life. So he's saying, I want you to meditate. But then in verse 5, 6, and 7, and, and even uh, 9, he repeats himself over and over again about be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. But this is where then, the first word in verse 10, becomes so important. Because the first nine verses, God's speaking. The first nine verses, God is telling Joshua. Verse 10 is Joshua's reply, Joshua's response, Joshua's plan of action. That's the reason why it's so important. Okay? The word then, now, now, now is decision time. Now this is where the rubber meets the road. Joshua, it's on you. It doesn't say then Joshua buried his hand in the sand and was like Jonah and went the other way. It doesn't say then Joshua questioned God and said, God, I can't do this. This is not me. It says then. Then. Then what? Then Joshua commanded the officer. In other words, he started repeating what God said and said, this is what we have to do. We're commanded to do it. Let's do it. So he was obedient to God. You see, this then, then, this word then is a game changer. This word then is, is not only a game changer, it's something that will change the world. It, it's, then is going to turn your life around. You're not going to be making sugar water or being sugar coated. You're going to make a drastic change in your life. You see, the word then will determine the fate of your prayer life. The word then will tell you how, what you're going to do spiritually and how you're going to grow spiritually in your life. Because then is the beginning of where I respond to God. God says it. God convicts me. God comforts me. God leads me in this direction. Then, then what? Then what do I do? What do I do? Then, I'll respond in one or two ways. Then I said, no. Or then I say, let's do it. You see, if you look at it here, it's decision time. Now, what Joshua had to face is no different. He had to, he had to face the Father with an attitude of renewal. In other words, my life's fixing to change based upon where I was at. I've always been a godly person, but now God's stretching my faith. Now, I guess 
what we need to ask ourselves today is how is our then? How is your then? When God calls, when God convicts, are you coming out of the closet to put God in there? How's your then? How, how do you respond? God said it, God's leading, God's convicting, God's encouraging, whatever. But how are you responding? Then, Brother Mike. Then, Joshua. Then, your name. Because if you're going to respond yes, you're going to face the Father with an attitude of renewal. If you don't, you'll face the Father with an attitude of doubt. No joy. And you'll face an attitude of saying, God, I'm not really sure I believe you. Because I don't know if I can do it. You see, did Joshua have some doubt? Yes. Did Peter have some doubt when he had to go back there and fish in the water? Yes. But they did it. Then, they did it. They obeyed God. How's your then? Would you bow your heads, please? You may be here this morning. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, the Bible says that you can't save yourself. The Bible says that you can't do enough works to enter into heaven. The Bible says you're not good enough. The Bible says that you have to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When we start singing this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to come forward. Shake my hand and say, Brother Mike, I need to be saved. This is your then. This is, this, this is your then right now. This is your decision time. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been saved. But you've never been scripture baptized. You see, the Bible teaches us that we, we confess our sins, we ask Jesus to come into our lives, to save us, to forgive us. We, we do it with a true heart. We do it with the right motives. And then the next step is we get baptized. And when we get baptized, we, we show the death, burial, and resurrection. We, we symbolize what Christ did when he got buried and arose from the grave. And maybe you're here this morning and you need to set a, a date where you can be baptized. It's th this is your then. Th th this is then for you. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning, you've been saved and you're baptized. And maybe God's leading you to this church. Th th this is where you need to be at. This, this is your then. You, you come this morning and say, Brother Mike, I, I'd like to join this church by like, faith, and order. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're here this morning, you're a member of this church, maybe you're a member of another church. And maybe as you look at your spiritual life, you look at your life as a closet, and say, you know, I've got a lot of things hanging in here that keeps me busy, and uh, it's time that I shed, get rid of a few things, so I can let God in. It, it's going to make a change in my life, but I've got to face the facts, it's real. Not only do I need to face the facts that it's real, I need to face the fears. The fears that I have that's causing me to restrain from what God wants. And then I have to face the Father with the attack of renewal, or with the attitude of renewal. In other words, Lord, if this is what you really want me to do, and I truly want to grow spiritually, I've got to change. Maybe... Maybe this morning you just want to come to the altar and pray. Maybe you're at the altar, the front pews. Maybe it's just between you and God. You don't have to say nothing to me. You can go straight to Him. Maybe you just, just something you need to pray about. It's just personal. It's between you and Him. Whatever God calls you to do this morning, you do. Because this is your then. T-H-E-N. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. God, we, we lift you up this morning. And, and God, I, I'm so thankful for people in the Bible like Joshua and Moses and Ruth and Mary and all these people in the Bible. Because Lord, what I see is imperfection. 
What I see is people that, like when you came on the scenes, it was like, wow, Lord, I, I don't know if I can do this. But how you encourage and how you strengthen and how you reminded them over and over again, keep the faith. Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. I'll be with you. Lord, just like you promised Joshua that you were with Moses, you would be with him. And that was a conditional thing, the Lord, where you had to be obedient. And Lord, if we're obedient to you today, that Lord, you'll be with us. Lord, you, you won't forsake us. You won't leave us. We, we're your child. The, the ones that are saved, Lord, we're children of God. Lord, I pray here this morning that if there's one here that don't know you as their Father, the God that they'll change this morning. I pray if there's someone here that needs to make a change in their life and, and they're just, their restraints are just, it's got a stronghold, Lord, that they'll break loose today and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Lord, this is your invitation. Lord, this is our then. It's up to us now. Your word has been spoken. How we respond. The Bible says in verse 10 of Joshua chapter 1, and Joshua commanded. In other words, he did what you told him to do after you spoke. Lord, I pray that we follow that example. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.